George Francis is no stranger to difficulty. Being a member of our very own SCT, senior chess team, he's often left wondering why even try. But tonight he's going to attempt to explain to you all, perhaps a more arduous task than taking on Gonzaga in chess, why do we do things that are difficult and yet not enjoyable? George Francis, everyone. There are few things in this world that drain the soul of hope as much as a seemingly impossible task. Whether it be mad homework that only gets more confusing the longer you look, look at it, or trying to beat my dad in anything that isn't a video game. These challenges can seem as hopeless as trying to eat soup with chopsticks. One way or another, we've all been put in a position where gouging our eyes out and throwing our collective corpses into a tank of starved piranhas can seem like a much nicer alternative to whatever Geneva Convention defined madness we would otherwise have to put ourselves through. So, I'm here to ask us all a question that we're all probably very familiar with. Why? Why did I do that? Well, much like any question asked for an audience, the answer to it varies. Usually, the answer is very simple. The reward, the spoils of the toils, the fruits of the labor. Just as Theodore Roosevelt once said, there is nothing in this world that is worth having or doing without pain, effort, or difficulty. There are many, almost too many examples of this risk for reward trade-off in our lives. But as a sixth year student, I am legally obligated to use the leaving suit as one of them. <laughs> I haven't come within 60 feet of any of my exam papers. And I already know that if I don't give 110%, I will very likely be writing those papers with my own blood. Time and time again, I have heard of the horror stories of the lanes people will go to to study harder and how I will never do a harder exam in my life. So it doesn't come to us as a surprise then that this diabolical test of willpower comes with it a reward of equal caliber. An extensive choice of courses to choose from which can put us on a further path to success. This is an example of what is known as positive risk taking, which is the careful deliberation of the potential risk and reward that can come from any given action. In this case, it's the potential for personal growth which motivates us to rise to a challenge and succeed. This deliberation of risk and reward affects us more in our lives than we may first realize. For example, when choosing a hobby or a sport. I, for one, started boxing over the summer after many years of picking up and then consequently dropping sports. I went in knowing that I'd be bad at first, since I had no experience going in. And my lack of energy would be a factor in what made the training and the exercises I would do that would make it about as difficult as trying to see with my eyes closed. But I went along with it anyway, because I knew whatever toils I would have to go through, or whatever pains I'd have to face, would be worth the benefits and potential enjoyment that I would get out of it. Now, these are all difficult things and reasons as to we, why we may do them. But I don't think anyone's going to look back on themselves and say, why did I do that? No. I don't want something logical. I want something backbreaking. Something like climbing Everest without an oxygen tank. Now, it may seem like old news now, but until 1978, it was considered completely impossible to climb Everest without a supply of oxygen. That was, of course, until Reinhold Messner and Peter Habeler decided that trying to achieve the impossible would be a pretty neat thing to have written on their epitaph. They were considered lunatics for attempting this, risking potential brain damage, if not death, just to prove something which quite clearly did not need to be proven. It was like trying to swim the English Channel with an anchor tied to your leg. It was already immensely difficult. Now you're just showing off. And yet. Despite all of this, on the 8th of May, 1978, they both had reached the peak. Reinhold Messner, in particular, described himself as nothing more than a single, narrow, gasping lung floating over the mists and summits. Now, I already hear people thinking, why? Why would someone put themselves through such torment for nothing? And that's because there doesn't need to be a reward. A reward acts as an incentive 
which can help motivate us towards a goal. But it is our self-drive and free will that gets the job done. After all, it isn't the carrot dangling from a stick that moves the horse. It's the horse that moves the horse. Just as it is our ambition and willingness to succeed and claim the reward that gets the job done. Okay, but what if it's been done before? If there's anything that spurns me on more than anything, it's doing something simply for the glory of having done it. I am by no means a valedictorian. I'm in none of the top classes, and I tend to struggle in areas where others have no difficulty. I am also constantly insecure about the achievements of others, how everyone around me has their life in order and has achieved much more than I have. But rather than using this as a, a reason to wallow in my own despair, I use it as a motivation to push myself in the areas where I struggle, to prove not just to myself, but to others around me, that when I set myself to a task, it gets done. And in the areas of my life where I consider myself uncontested, I challenge myself anyway, placing handicaps and self-imposed challenges on myself with no other reward than having the foolishness to attempt and conquer it. And there is no reward greater than having someone waltz on up to me and say, George, why did you beat that giant to death with a spoon? And then I look them dead in the eye and say, because I can. <laughs> why do I do this? Why not? What is the point in giving less than our best? What is there to learn from taking the easy path? And what is the pride in staying in our comfort zone? Ladies, gents, and fools alike, I know nothing of the true nature of the pains you've all endured, but I wish you all the best of luck when it comes time for you all to face them. It has been an honor to speak to all of you. I hope to speak to you all again, and until then, I bid thee farewell. <laughs>